Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I dive into this, I have three important facts to go over. Uh, the first one is I'm actually taking a medicine right now that gives me hot flashes, a subject which my wife finds endlessly amusing. Um, and every time I've spoken in the last three years, I have managed to not be taking it at that time. This is not one of those times. If I begin sweating up here as if I've just run up and down Mount Kilimanjaro, I'm okay. I'm not gonna have a heart attack. I'm not gonna faint, it's all okay. Um, and I brought my emergency you know, dry off pack so I don't, someone else doesn't slip and hurt themselves. And now see, if I don't tell you what the medicine's for, you're all gonna assume all sorts of horrible things. So I'm not gonna tell you until tonight at the party so I can see what y'all tweet about it. Um, it's not that horrible, but I just wanna see what you come up with. Uh, the other thing is, I seem to have sort of a curse with SEO Moz. Last year, um, when I came to MozCon to speak, uh, the week and before, I stepped on a ground wasp nest and got stung 11 times. I got food poisoning, and I cracked a, a tooth, um, first one. Uh, this time, I got here, feeling pretty good, nothing terrible happened, got out of my car, went to put my wallet in my back pocket, and ripped an enormous hole in my pants. Um, so I, I'm actually up here with an enormous hole in my pants. Uh, and, and, and the buttons on my shirt don't match, so never let it be said that I do not leave it all hanging out for SEO Moz and MozCon. I'm just, I just want to get all those important facts out, so that's why I'm not going to turn, not going to turn around. Um, I'm just going to face front the entire time. So content. Why is it that content is like the dried turd of the internet marketing world? I, I don't understand. And, and I did not just say that because Bob was up here speaking before. All right? I, I came up with this long before he, he, I heard him speak today, which was great, but I, I just don't want to think you to think I'm stealing his turd expressions. Um, it's one of these things that no one notices until they step on it. And then there's a sort of embarrassed moment where they all get it out of the way, and they get rid of it, and then they move on. And I know I'm here at MozCon, and everybody here is part of the, the, the content, um, the content disciples. You, you all believe in content. You think it's the greatest thing ever. I'm trying to get myself so there we go. The light is in my eyes. That means I must be in the right place now. Um, it's, it's really this thing that has been shoved off to the side, and even if all of us in here think that we're pro-content, if you came to me and said, I need a 300-word article on superconductors that's guaranteed to get me tons of links, and I said, no problem, $5,000, you would say, you're out of your freaking mind. I'm gonna go to Elance, and I'll get 30 people to write it, and one of them will probably come up with something decent. We've all also been in this conversation, and I know we've all been in this one. You're almost done with the website, or you're doing your SEO campaign, and you're almost ready to launch, and suddenly somebody says, you know, it might be the CEO or your client or whatever, who's doing the content? I thought you were doing the content. I thought you were doing the content. What? You know, everybody freaks out, right? And, and so then someone else says, oh, I think it's the marketing guy. You know, because the marketing guy used to be a writer, but the marketing guy is a marketing guy, right? He wants nothing to do with writing. I'm in marketing. I'm too good for writing. Um, so he comes along and says, you know what? No problem. Uh, if you can give me a budget of 50 bucks, I'll get those 50 product descriptions done for a buck each on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Elance, and we'll be all set. And I know it seems like I'm being really mean and nasty, but the truth is, I have fallen into this one so many times. I have been one of those people every single time. Um, so anyone who reads my blog knows I will never call someone else a name that I will not also call myself. So in this one, I have been every one of those jackasses at some point or another. Um, and this is a question I was actually asked. When I started my company in 95, we were all about content and writing and stuff because there really wasn't much of an internet to work on. Uh, so people would come to me and say, you know, I need, to, I need X or Y, I need a white paper. And someone actually came to me and said, I need 10,000 words about superconductors. Is $250 okay? And I said, no. Um, and I didn't get the job. Um, <laughs> If you look at budgets now, the content budget is this tiny little thing that has shrunk down to a spot so small, so small, that the light of common sense cannot escape it. It has become so super dense. So getting serious now, the question is why has this happened? And I think a lot of it's happened because, you know, if, if I'm the content over here and I'm doing all this research and stuff, then the CEO and the people who worry about profits and everything, they're way over here. 
and they're looking at profits, and they're looking at cost, and they're looking at sales and conversions, and the content is this thing that's way over there that they worry about maybe three times in their career <laughs> when they're relaunching their website. Um, and that's led to this belief that content is a sunk cost. And then, of course, along came the internet, and suddenly content was valuable because you could get massive amounts of traffic with this content, right? It's this great stuff. Uh, but you still didn't have to write decent content, right? You could write anything as long as it was just good enough to slip by the search engines and not trigger a filter like, you know, we just Markov chained everything or, or you know, we just pulled in 10 RSS feeds and randomly mixed them or whatever we did. Um, so, see, they're even sending me messages now of where I should stand and stuff. That's great. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it got to this thing where it was all about good enough. Good enough to get by the search engines. And my whole point here is that is no longer the case. Good enough just isn't anymore. All right? Good enough is not good enough. And there's a couple reasons. The first one is, of course, everybody knows about Panda. Panda is now ranking content site-wide. It looks at your entire website. So if you have a website where 50% of your pages are great, 50% of your pages are total crap, the crap content is an anchor, and it's gonna drag down your ability to rank with all the good content. And that's a huge problem, right? It just drags you down. So the old approach of let's just throw wet noodles at the wall until something sticks doesn't work anymore because it's all gonna impact your ability to rank. Second thing is competition. I'm not the only one who's figured out that content is suddenly becoming more valuable. Everybody is starting to work on coming up with better and better content. Why do you think infographics, why do you think we're all now drowning in, in a sea of infographics? It's because somebody just said, you know, that stuff that Wired Magazine's always done seems to actually work. We should try that. So competition. So my point is, again, good enough isn't. It's not good enough. We've got to find a way to get the content closer to the people in the C-suite, the clients, whoever it is that you're working with. And what I've done, and what we've done at Portent is, I kind of sat down with, with some of my team and I said, what if we thought about content the same way we think about landing pages? And we came up with this very deliberate process. Because if you think about landing pages, they're highly creative. You're writing copy, you're doing a design, a lot of that is intuitive. And this whole idea that you can do multivariate testing to make landing pages work beautifully is not, it, it's not something that we arrived at naturally. <laughs> Um, even way back in the days of John Caples and David Ogilvy and, and, and those guys, and no, I'm not that old, I never met David Ogilvy or John Caples, if you're gonna ask Rand wherever you are, because you always make fun of my age. Yeah, there we go. Um, uh, you, you can't, you know, that's not a leap that's easy to make. So I just said, what if we did the same thing here? And we came up with this four-step process that's, that, and you can see them up here now, I'm gonna go through them all in, in excruciating detail. Uh, and what we came up with in general, and this is if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember these two things. First thing is document everything. And I'm not talking about just the writing you do, I'm talking about actually documenting the process that you went through to get to the process that you went through to get to the process of writing the content. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. The other thing is, remember, you've gotta connect the dots. That if there's keyword research here, and then there's opportunity gap analysis here, and then there's sourcing of content here, and then there's publishing and promoting here. Um, your boss, your client, whoever it is, even the people that you give the content to to read, they're not gonna have as good an understanding of it unless you have connected the dots for them. So I'm gonna go through each of these one at a time. The first one's opportunity gap analysis, and Richard Baxter actually went through a lot of this in detail this afternoon, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it. The basic idea behind opportunity gap analysis is find the easy wins. Find the places where you can move up in the rankings quickly. Why kill yourself? Why beat yourself bloody running into a brick wall trying to rank for a single word phrase that has 300 million competitors if you can actually go after a phrase where you're already at number five, you know you can get to number three, and that's gonna quintuple your traffic. Right? So just a quick example here. This is, traffic, this is data from my blog. Um, I don't have conversions, and no, I don't make any money on my blog, so uh, there's no sales or anything there. If you have an e-commerce site, a B2B site, you can just take a look at pages on your site that are behaving the best. 
This is where I start my opportunity gap analysis. It's not with keywords, but with content. And if you take a look here, you can see that uh, at the bottom, there's this page, 10 questions for social media experts. And it performs pretty well. It's an older piece of content. It's got people staying on there for almost four minutes. Um, so I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna say, all right, you know, this is a possibility. And then I'm also gonna look at a tool like PostRank. Um, I get creepy crawlies on my neck when I start thinking about people who say that they're calculating engagement metrics. I don't know how you calculate engagement metrics. But uh, Google did buy PostRank, so there's gotta be something there. <laughs> um, so you, know, you can take a look there and just see how those pages are behaving. Uh, and then I'll look at the keywords. Then I look at keywords and I say, all right, how much traffic am I getting? Is there a, a, a junction here? And there is. I've got this page about asking social media experts questions, and then I've got the fact that the third best traffic generating term on my blog is social media expert. And yeah, my blog's traffic is kind of sad sometimes. Um, uh, so you know, I, I'm getting traffic on this. So now the question is, is there an opportunity? Well, yeah, there is. And you can see right here, uh, I'm number four, I think for 10 questions to ask social media expert, if you type in social media expert. So there's definitely an opportunity. I can move up. That means we've found an opportunity. Now the question is, can I move up? First thing I do is the, the old standby and all in title search. Everybody familiar with an all in title search? No? Yes? Yes? Okay. I can't actually see any of you because the lights are right in my eyes, so I'm just guessing. Um, scream in despair if you don't know. Uh, Oh, God. Um, all in title. <laughs> I haven't gotten to that part of the presentation yet. Um, all in title just shows you all the pages that have that exact phrase in the title in that order. Um, not too many pages, 35,000, I can take those odds. And then if I go into Open Site Explorer, which looks different now, but you get the idea, and I look at the site that ranks immediately below, uh, above me, yes, I can definitely move past that site. Um, in fact, I can crush them with my nerd muscles because they're so far behind um, in linking root domains, it shouldn't really be that big of an issue. So the next thing is you want to expand, right? You want to expand, you want to find other keywords. You guys all know how to do this, I am sure. And you want to document, and I said document before and this is what I mean. You want to put together what I call a keyword map, I think some other people call it that. You want to have a sheet that shows the ranking page, the phrase, where you're ranking, the current monthly traffic that you're getting, um, the competition, so that at a glance, you can immediately look at this sheet and say, here are my targets, here's what I need to work on. So again, document, document everything. Document until you are sick of Google Spreadsheets. Learn to use Excel and or Google Spreadsheets. Shove those things in front of your boss. Do not let your boss just say, oh, yeah, okay. they need to see it. They need to understand what's going on. Um, so now you've drawn the dot from here, which is this kind of mushy creative space where you're working on writing, over to here, where you've actually got an opportunity gap. Now it's about subject matter analysis. This is the scary part, because you want to know what everyone's saying. And yes, search data can help, keyword research can help, but you need to take a couple more steps, because if all you're doing is looking at keywords, then the only data you're getting is after the fact. So if news is emerging right now, if something's happening in a story right now, or if there's just a brand that is so strong that no one's gonna bother searching for it, um, but it's still a, a subject of discussion, yeah, I can't see how that would ever happen, but if it did, um, you wanna make sure that you're gonna capture that. So you could do the approach of, you know, just go take a look at the Googles. Geez, how long can it take? Five minutes maybe. I kill my staff with this statement lots of times. I go to and say, this shouldn't take more than 45 minutes. And then someone looks like they're gonna hit me with a chair, so I shut up. Um, or you can do this in a really methodical, deliberate way, and you can record and analyze conversations. And no, I do not mean this in the Rupert Murdoch, News of the World way. Um, what I mean is there are all these conversations going out there, on out there in the web, right? Tons of stuff, there's Twitter, there's blogs, there's comments on forums, there is stuff everywhere. So what you wanna do is you wanna collect all that in one place and build your own little search engine. This is where people scream in despair. Oh God, 
Um, because most people look at me, and I, this is a direct quote that someone gave me. Ian, I am so freaking busy that I am answering emails in the bathroom, something I didn't need to know. Um, I do not have time to learn how to build a search engine. Are you insane? Um, relax, it's not really quite what I meant. Uh, there are plenty of tools out there that will let you do this. First one is Google Alerts. I'm sure everybody's heard of those, of that. Um, is that working? Yeah, that worked. So I'm just gonna take a look at you know, what is either an on-rushing train that's gonna destroy us all or nothing at all. I guess we'll find out in a week. Uh, and I set that up as a feed and I can subscribe to it in Google Reader. And then I position it all so I can analyze it all. Okay, and that, okay, I am pushing the right button. There we go. Um, and then I take all that and I, I put it together in Google Reader in a folder a single folder, and this is important because it lets us collect all this content. So I can go and get a Google alert, and get a Twitter feed, and get you know subscriptions to 10 different sites that aren't showing up in Google as well as I want. I can get Google alerts on different terms, whatever I want to do. Then I can jump over to manage subscriptions, and I can make this a public page. And once I've done that, once this is a public page, there's actually a place I can go to see all this stuff. And that page has an RSS feed. So what I just did is I took a whole bunch of RSS feeds, <clears throat> pulled them into an RSS reader to generate another RSS feed. I know, it's kind of, there's something vaguely wrong about it all, but, um, but it does work. And now I've got this Atom feed, and I can go get that URL, and now I just need to go and analyze it. And for analysis, and I'm just putting the, the screaming lady up here, uh, I'm pretty sure she has iron fillings, and it's bothered me for ages. I'm trying to figure out when this photo was taken and, and where, but um, I was also a history major. It's another useless piece of education I had. Um, so you're gonna wanna take this, this mass of content, smush it together, remove all the words that you don't need to look at, get a count of the most common words in it, but then also get a count of the highest scoring two-word or two-word phrases or bigrams and three-word phrases, trigrams. Uh, yeah, and you can do that by hand if you're insane, um, or you can try and build something, or you can use a tool that I actually just finished putting together, um, and I have many disclaimers behind this one, because this was something I basically wrote while overly caffeinated and sitting in my house and at two o'clock in the morning and stuff like that. Um, but what it does, see I did go to law school, is you can paste that Atom URL in there, and it will just spit out trigrams, bigrams, single word count, and just a big raw lump of text that has all the stop words removed. And you can take that and paste it into Wordle or something if you want to do a word cloud. Um, and then what you can do with this is this is where you can start drawing some conclusions. Now you'll notice this was a pretty poor data set. I mean, my number one word is see all stories. Number two is this topic. And then on this, that's worthless, right? Um, that's because by default, Google Reader only gives you 20 items in a feed. So what you want to do is you want more items in the feed. If you just add a question mark n equals 75, and all these smart asses out there, don't put n equals 7,500, okay? Because the app is running on Google App Engine and it will just shut down if you do that. 75, Evan, did you hear that? 75, <laughs> not 750. Um, so you use that, it will get you more items, and then you get a much better result. And you can see here with 75 items, I'm suddenly getting far, far better data because my the, the, the algorithm I'm using has a bigger training set, so it gets much better information, so I'm getting a better look at what people are talking about. Now this is kind of interesting. If I'm writing about the debt ceiling, the main concern people have is the impact it's gonna have on the stock market, and I know that immediately because the top bigram and trigram are Dow Jones and Dow Jones news wires, um, and yes, I know there's news associated there too, so you have to do some extra investigating to make sure, um, and I know who the key people are, and a few other details, and then there's a lot of noise that you gotta filter out, and that's where you still have to use your brain. Um, and then here's if I did social media yesterday, okay? So someone named Julie Spira was doing a, a speaking gig somewhere, so she was popping up all over. Um, and if I take either one of these, if I don't really know about these subjects, 
Because obviously these are things we all know about. But if I don't know anything about them, this is pretty valuable. Because this is like, well, here's a person maybe I want to contact or I want to do some research on her. Just want to figure out what her place is in all this. Um, you know, David Gertzoff, who is he? What, is, what part does he play in this? So you just want to take a look at all that kind of information that you can get out of here. Uh, you also want to grab Twitter feeds and put them in. And Twitter just got rid of the nice little RSS link on their search results page. Because what I used to do is go over to Twitter and I would do a search and I would type in you know, whatever my search term is and then I would just subscribe to the search result. And you get this constant fire hose of data about that particular search. Um, they did away with the button, the link still works. So, and yeah, I know now, about five minutes from now, this is gonna stop working, but. Um, <laughs> Search.twitter.com, search.adam, question mark, Q equals whatever your phrase is. Uh, maybe they'll put the button back. Maybe it was an oversight. So with all this data, you have to draw conclusions. And my caution here is, yes, you do still need a brain. Um, your brain is still the most powerful computer you've got at your desk. You're going to have to use it at some point. Now might as well be the time. Uh, and then from that, you can finally start brainstorming story ideas. Articles, content types, videos, photos, uh, infographics, stories, narrative, whatever you're going to put together, any kind of content, this is when you start really thinking about it. And again, you document everything. I don't know if folks can see this okay, but this is a headline list. It's another tab in that same spreadsheet I showed you a few minutes ago with the opportunity gap analysis. And this lists all my headlines. It also lists the date, that it's been, that someone picked it up and started writing about it, who it's been assigned to, whether it's been used, and if you looked more to the right, which of course we can't do here, um, you'd see things like the phrase to which it's connected, the page it's supposed to be helping, things like that. So you're documenting everything. And now at this point in the process, we've gone from way over here, where it's all mushy and nobody knows what's going on, to over here, where we can connect to Opportunity Gap and say, this is why we're pursuing this, to over here, we're going to say, okay, because of what we're pursuing, this is what we've come up with for stories and headlines. And it's not so critical for you as it is for your team, and it will be later if someone comes back and says, why did you do this? Um, my analogy is, you know, the day that I finally snap and, and move to Walla Walla to open a guinea pig farm, uh, there has to be enough documentation somewhere that other people can pick up my projects. Well, this would be the documentation that could do it. So now we get to sourcing. Sourcing means finding the people to create the stuff for you. Um, you will have to hire experts. You will have to hire writers. You will have to hire designers. I have a full-time team of copywriters at Portent, um, but we write about everything from uh, uh, colon cleansing, ooh, nasty stuff. Um, to, uh, no, I guess it's very good for your health though. Sorry, sorry, I don't want to dis a, client, dis a client in front of all of MozCon. Um, to, you know, bulletproof vests, to cloud-based infrastructure solutions. Uh, we can't, you know, two or three or four copywriters can't cover all that. Uh, so you're gonna have to go out and find experts. My first rule of finding experts is if you pay crap, you will get crap. Uh, it's again with the, the whole Elance thing. You know, you can't just go out there and expect that if you're paying a nickel a word, you're going to get anything of any use whatsoever. You're not. I usually assume that if I'm writing something under 300 words or getting something written under 300 words, that's going to cost at least 50 cents a word. At least. And I'm not going to count. I'm just, as a rough estimate, I would expect to pay at least $150 for a really well-written piece. Maybe if I have someone who's writing regularly for me and it's for a site about video games or something, you know, they're willing to take less because it's about video games and they like it. Um, but, you know, and, and I'll sometimes charge three, four, five hundred dollars to write something like that. Or if it's someone I know is going to be a pain, I'll charge two thousand. <laughs> um, whatever, you know, you get what you pay for. And if it's more than 300 words, you're looking really by specialty. It is a lot cheaper to get someone to write to chronicle the history of the pet rock than it is to get to someone to write a 20-page white paper on the future of nuclear physics in the United States. You're going to pay more for the latter than the former. Just brace yourself and be ready for it. Uh, you want to recruit constantly. We are constantly getting and asking for new folks who want to come in and freelance. 
We have a form on our site. Um, people go there, they fill it out. We just keep them there all the time. And then we score writers when they come in. We evaluate what they can write about. We score the performance of the stuff they write. And we score the perform their performance in the work they do. And this is something we've done for a long time. But when you fit it together with all the other stuff, it really makes that connection really well. So now, we're going from mushy, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to get faster with this little chorus thing I'm doing. Um, from mushy to, what was the next one? Wow, that's terrible. Um, no, it's mushy to opportunity gap, that's it. Opportunity gap, this is because I had kids. If you start walking across a room or a stage, you forget why you started before you get there. Um, opportunity gap to uh, uh, subject matter to sourcing, and it's all connected. I went out and hired that writer because we were writing about X, which we discovered because we were doing our research. So the next thing is stacking the deck. How do you make it easier to promote your content? And I'll bet everybody here already knows how to do this. This is all about going out and using social media to curate and become an established authoritative curator of content in the subject area where you're going to be publishing. So, for example, I do about 10 to 11 tweets a day on, on my feed, on the Portent Int feed on Twitter, um, and on Google Plus, and on Facebook. It's getting kind of irritating, actually. Uh, <clears throat> I'm doing all of those so that I can get people to understand that I can give them valuable information. And the trick here is, again, good enough isn't. You've got to do a really superlative job. You've got to be putting stuff up there that's so good that people don't care that all you're really doing is trying to build an audience. And people say, it's all right. I'm happy to be an audience. You just justified your entire existence with that last link you sent to me. <laughs> um, that's really where you want to be. And then the key to that is scheduling. So what I'll do is I'll take something like that same feed that you put together so that you can analyze content. And I'll find in the morning five or 10 really interesting things. Things that I really think the people who read conversation marketing are going to find useful too. And then I just, the angry fork was just too awesome. I had to go with the angry fork. Um, so you know, when I find that article, I can navigate to it. And then I use a tool called Timely. How many people here use Timely? Oh, wow. Geez. OK. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I put this little bookmarklet in my toolbar. And when I click it, it schedules my next tweet to go out at a time when Timely has calculated is the best time to get a response from my audience. So I'll take 10 minutes in the morning, find the really good stuff when I can really focus on finding the good stuff, so I'm not doing it in between phone calls or whatever. And I basically put together my day's magazine that's going to go out on Twitter. There are other ways to schedule. You can use Hootsuite. It has a scheduling tool in it. Um, and if you really want to get ridiculous, you can create a Google spreadsheet. And I can give this to you if you want. Um, you can create a Google spreadsheet that automatically grabs a tagged feed from Google Reader uh, and turns it into the right format to then be put into Hootsuite for bulk scheduling. So I've actually put something together where everything I tag to go up on the Portent feed, which is a special feed for people at Portent when I tag things that I want them to read. Um, and I can actually take that, and I can import it into Hootsuite, and then it will just automatically publish throughout the day. It's kind of ridiculous, but it does actually help a lot, and it does make it a lot easier. Hootsuite, of course, lets me schedule publishing to all sorts of different places, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, not Google Plus yet. I'm assuming they're going to get there, hopefully. And this is all about audience building, right? That's what I'm doing here. I'm building the audience of potential readers for when I produce something I really want to show to them. That's my own. So you take third-party content and you curate so that when you're ready to introduce your own content, you're in a good position to do it. And again, document everything. Okay, S Pay the $9 a month or whatever it is for Bitly Pro. For God's sake. <laughs> it's only $9. Um, and then when you do all your, your domain shrinking using Bitly or your URL shrinking, you'll get data on how many clicks you got and what performed the best. If you're using Timely, you'll know what times of day performed the best. You want all that information. I think I just accidentally shined the laser from this thing in someone's eyes. I apologize. Um, I don't know whose insurance covers that. but. Uh, 
So some really important lessons in the last few minutes here. The first thing is, yes, your brain is required. Okay? Don't, don't, don't send me a letter in two weeks saying, you know, I went and I wrote this piece of content and I thought it was such a good idea and it didn't work because blah, 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 blah. Um, I, 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 I am sympathetic, but just remember, you do have the most powerful computer up here. You can't just follow the steps mechanically. You are not building a printing press. It's an assumption I think a lot of people make. You are not building a printing press. You are building the process before the printing press, which no one has ever built. We created the printing press, what, 400 years ago? And we still haven't made any other advances in how we produce content. No one has been able to automatically produce good content. Marketing is hard work. You have to do work. You don't get the automatic, let's kick the crap of every, out of everyone else on the web because we know a secret tag, all right? It doesn't exist. Yeah, if you've got a garage full of Viagra and you want to rank number one for two weeks and you don't care if that site gets flushed down the toilet after that, sure, you can do that. But if you're building a long-term brand with a long-term presence on the web, you're going to have to work hard. And no, it's not always fair that someone like Target can tr trample all over you on, in the in the rankings, even though their site is an SEO catastrophe, I don't know what to tell you there. You gotta go with your own advantages. But this stuff is not easy. And the last one is, don't be a jackass. A uh, shining example that Microsoft very kindly gave to us a couple days ago when Amy Winehouse died, um, I, I, don't, I have no words for this. Um, someone who did this, if they were working for me, they would not get fired. They would walk into my office and there would be clear plastic on the floor. Okay, I don't know how someone writes something like this. All right, that's not really true. I've never killed or even touched an employee, so. Uh, and the medicine I'm taking has nothing to do with that. Um, it's for my back. When my back heals, I might start, you know, but. Um, and then there was the Huffington Post. This one, I, I don't know what this woman was thinking. Um, I, I just, I, I read that and my jaw just hit my desk. Um, how exactly is Amy Winehouse's untimely death a lesson for small business owners? I, I don't know, but anyway. Um, so don't be a jackass. And finally, measure everything. Measure everything. Don't just measure the number of views that your new article gets or your new infographic. We often have clients who say, well, you know, it didn't perform that well. Because they're just looking at page views or they're looking at links acquired, which may lag quite a bit. But then we'll go and we'll say, well, yeah, but it got you know, 1,500 stumbles, and it got all these tweets, and it got all this Facebook stuff. And sure enough, the keywords we were targeting with it all started to move up. Um, and, and that was because of this article. So measure everything. Don't rely on a single metric to show the success of your content. So just to kind of quickly paraphrase all that stuff, um, good enough isn't. The things you got to keep in mind are you got to connect those dots all the way from mushiness to the C-suite or whoever it is that you're working for. Uh, you need to document everything. And you need to be ready to iterate. Okay, this is not easy. However, it is a ton of fun. And I ended right on zero. That's great. So I'm ready for questions.